ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, Sue Foley with us. She's uh, she's going to be coming to the Sportsman's on April 7th. And uh, it's going to be a special blues concert because Sue has had a number of cancellations uh, due to the, uh, you know, goings on in the past couple of years. She's had to reschedule this show. And I, don't, I would have to say, uh, Sue, how are you, by the way? I'm great. I'm doing fantastic. Super. You know, I, w I would like to just say that you're probably, the, as far as I can think of, like the perfect guest for, for this show because... Um, we are, uh, WBFO is, is affiliated with um, the Buffalo Toronto public media. So, oh, so because of the cross border thing uh, and your roots and, and I think you live up in Toronto periodically, right? Well, I have, um, but I'm in Austin, Texas right now. I've been here for well, close to three years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you kind of got stuck there for a little while, didn't you? Well, you know, it was a welcome, but no, I, I'm not stuck at all. I, I, I've been living here and working out of here for, since I got back, actually, since we released the Ice Queen, just before that, I moved back. Love that album, by the way. We play it a lot here on the show. Well, thank you. And you've got a brand new one called uh, Pinky's Blues, and uh, that looks like it's doing great for you, uh, charting and lots of, uh, you're getting a lot. Of, uh, is it me or are you, just as, are you as popular as ever right now? Um, yeah, I think we're doing as well as ever. I think we bounced back uh, post-pandemic and things are really picking up. Um, we've got a lot of tour dates coming up and the album's doing great. So I couldn't be, I couldn't be happier really. I'm just, we're just thrilled to be playing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to mention that the uh, the Sportsman Show, the showtime is 7 p.m. Tickets are uh, $25. Is a VIP meet and greet, and I love this idea. Uh, for $70, you, uh, you get a uh, VIP laminate signed CD of the new album, Pinky's Blues. You get an official Sue Foley t-shirt, and of course, you get to meet with Sue. But I wanted to, um, to point out that... Uh, that Pinky is your uh, is is basically the name for your Paisley uh, Pink Strat or Telecaster that you've been playing for for how many decades now? Well, over three decades. I've had the same guitar, uh, Pinky, of course. Um, so yeah, that the guitar is 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 pretty famous now. She's a Pink Paisley Fender Telecaster. I got her brand new off the rack brand new when they reissued them in the late 80s and and i got it in vancouver and um i've had that same guitar through every album through almost every tour from then till now if you can believe it um i don't fly with her anymore so i won't have her in buffalo oh but if no I'm doing, okay. yeah but if i'm doing local dates here in texas i'll have it i'll have her along but i've got two new pinkies that i bring out and they look just like brand new versions of my original Pinky. How close are they sounding to, to the original? Mm, I mean, I can get something. It's, you know, that original is kind of special. I just, yeah. wow, I never changed the pickups on it or anything. I've had it refretted, but I didn't modify it. And I'm just, I, they don't sound really like it, to be honest. But you know, I, I, can, I can get my sound. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. You're always going to sound like yourself on any guitar when you're a player at uh, at your level. I have uh, a bunch of those Japanese reissues myself. I'm, I'm more of a Strat guy, and um, I haven't sold any of the Strat ones. You know, the bunch of them are photo flames. I had Buddy Guy sign one of them for me, but they are just fantastic guitars. And I did have a Tele at one time. It yeah. Was a it was a Rosewood photo flame. had a huge neck on it. And I ended up selling it to Joe Bonamassa and his dad this one time, uh, one of the last times that they had a, a guitar show here in town. But um, I'm just really fond of those. I mean, they can they can rival some of the uh, some of the U.S. made ones. And when you find a special one like Pinky, I mean, it's just that's that's one that was just made for you. Yeah, I really kind of lucked out on that because that guitar is just so great. It sounds so good, and it's just stood the test of time and i mean i have beat that guitar up i've traveled i've lost it on airplanes <laughs> i've dropped it i've you know i've messed it up a million ways but it's just 
keeps going. It keeps sounding great. Yeah, it does. And uh, we're going to play Pinky's Blues for our listeners right now so they can hear it for themselves. The song Pinky's Blues, it, it reminded me a little bit of um, Earl Hooker's Blues and D Natural. Was that on purpose or by accident? Well, you know, that's a happy accident. I've been playing. I'm a huge Earl Hooker fan. I would say he's my number one. Uh, I love Earl Hooker. I always have. And I uh, used to do Blues and D Natural. So this is sort of a reworking of it. And yeah, it, it's it's similar, but I, I kind of branch off and do my own thing. But you know, yeah, and that's, you're, yeah, you're and that's exactly right. <laughs> what's that? Say that again, please. You're, you're basically very right on that one. Yeah. Um, and, and in that similar uh, context, I noticed um, you leaned when you did the, the Frankie Lee Sims cover of She Likes to Boogie uh, Real Low. It's, I mean, to me, that, that goes back to like Louis Jordan and uh, the Blue Light Boogie, you know. So uh, are you leaning towards the Frankie Lee Sims version of that um, because of your, you know, leaning towards the Texas blues tradition in, in some ways on this album? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we copped the Frankie Lee version. Um, I didn't do the original version. So the Frankie Lee Sims version is pretty, I mean, we're, we're basically that doing it exact you know, um yeah. i do branch off for a second and ad lib a solo but we're just trying to do some frankie lee sims because it's cool and definitely fits in with the texas vibe sure sure and that's one thing i, I want to let my my listeners know if they're not aware i personally and i'm sure there's a lot of people that agree with me i feel like you are um one of the one of the last torch bearers of the of the Texas uh, blues guitar tradition um, from from the golden age of Antones. I mean, your your first album came out in 1992 on the Clifford Antones label, and your sound with Pinky, you're not doesn't sound like you're using any pedal. Sounds like straight into like a Fender basement or something like that, and it's just pure, you know, blues and very 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 steeped in the Texas tradition. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'm, I'm definitely carrying the torch for that. That's what we were trained in. That's what we were educated in. Um, Clifford Antone gave us all a good education. And of course, all the musicians in Austin that we followed, not just, you know, people like Jimmy Vaughn, who I still get to see quite a bit, but even, you know, Denny Freeman, who passed away a couple of years ago, great guitar player, Derek O'Brien, um, right. you know, Mel Brown, just... Angela Straley, Lou Ann Barton, all the people, George Rains from the scene, you know, those are the people that kind of brought us up. And, um, you know, there's, there's younger people under us too that, that play really well. But I'm definitely carrying on that tradition proudly. Um, it's kind of the way I was taught to play. I mean, I, I did know how to play when I got to Austin, but I was really the Texas blues I wanted to know about. And, and that's very a very specific style. So... I'm glad you pointed that out because and that's what this album is really about yeah yeah especially uh dallas man for instance it's you know that that song uh seems to be you know about uh, broadly about a lot of the just fantastic guitar players that came from this one area of texas you know why don't you tell us about that a little bit well that's exactly right uh you kind of nailed it it's uh the song is a is a love letter to the Dallas guitar players that I love. <laughs> there's, so many, there's so many of them. When you think about even Blind Lemon Jefferson used to run through Dallas and play in Deep Ellum and um, that tradition just kind of went from there. Everybody went through there, including Frankie Lee Sims and Little Sunhouse, Little Sun Jackson. And I mean, not Sunhouse, Little Sun Jackson. Um, but then, you know, later on in the 60s, there was a pretty robust scene and then the, of course the Vaughn brothers came out of there and Anson, Funderburg, and Derek O'Brien, Denny Freeman, I mean all these guys, Doyle, Bramhall. Yeah, it's just it's sure. just like it's quite astounding when you think of it. Yeah, it really is. And, and T-Bone uh, Walker, T-Bone Walker, Freddie King. I mean, that's some pretty big uh yeah, it doesn't get any bigger, yeah. frankly. It yeah, just doesn't. it doesn't, yeah. So. You know, and I've been lucky to have um, a lot of the ones you mentioned on the show, you know, Doyle, uh, Doyle II and Jimmy, Jimmy Vaughn and um, 
you started with Mark Hummel. Uh, Mark was on with Anson Funderburg not too not too long ago, within within a few years, I believe. And um, I just love, I, I just gravitate towards that style and sound myself. I wanted to mention that you know, for for a lot of your recordings, you're collaborating with uh, with Mike Flanagan, the keyboardist, uh, and kicks bass with um, with you, and also with Jimmy Vaughn. And uh, you've got Chris Layton on drums from Stevie Ray Vaughan's uh, Double Trouble and also from uh, from the Archangels. So uh, the recording also is just sounds great. It, you've got this live room sound for your guitar and the other instruments. And it just sounds like it's 100% live, no overdubs. And that's why it's also uh, important to point it out, what we're talking about, about you being a torchbearer. Because, you know, to, to play like that is it's not easy and to serve it up like that is not easy and you're doing it and it's like um you're also playing rhythm for yourself so so you're really adept at singing and playing rhythm and lead in a trio context like that is this is that something that's always come natural to you or do you work on it are there some steps you take to really uh get it down well it it, it was something i did when i was very young and um, playing trio. I mean, I toured trio the first, I don't know, eight years of my recording career for Antones. We were just on the road, the three of us, me, John Penner, who's in my band again. He's also on this album on bass. He's from Canada, but me, him, and Freddie Farrell, we were a pretty good trio unit and we toured everywhere. So I got, I got really used to playing trio and people like it. There's nowhere to hide. So you know, you know who's doing you you know who's doing what because if there's a guitar here you're hearing you know it's me um but you really all have to be on on the ball and and mike flanagan who produced the album he knew that we could handle that i mean he knew we could play live he wanted it to be live and we were fine with it um so we're all playing in the moment there are no overdubs on this album we couldn't overdub I mean, everything was bleeding into everything else. Like we, there was a couple moments on the vocal where I was like, oh man, I wish I could go back and fix that. And I tried, <laughs> there was yeah. no way to fix it. So I was like, okay, well, that's just going to be like that. Um, yeah. But that's what you get when you take that chance. Um, so maybe you, uh, maybe there are a couple of flubs on it. However, I think the energy and the spontaneity that uh, overcompensates for anything that's Anything, true. You know? It's true, and and not to say that uh, that the Ice Queen is uh, you know is, is any less uh, potent in its in its delivery of performance, but it's that sounds more like a produced record with other other guitar players. I think you had um, Charlie Sexton on a track or two, and and some other things going on on that album where where maybe there was some some room to to produce it a little more. You know, with the types of it's songs that you had. That's a little more produced, but most of that is live too. You'd be surprised. Like even the when we had the five Texas horns in the studio, that was all cut live with Jimmy Vaughn. So I it believe pretty, it. Yeah, I it's pretty it. wild. Uh, Flanagan really loves to do that stuff. Like he wants to hear it that way. He always brings up the fact that all our favorite blues records were cut that way, and that's how people did it. And that's how you should be able to do it. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, we're alive. Right. We're live players so when i get out on the road and i i can tour this album which i've been doing what you hear you'll hear it <laughs> you'll hear the same stuff if you like the album pinky's blues it's gonna sound just like that because that's what we pull off live well i'm really looking forward to it because I'm, I'm not playing that night I'm, I'm planning on being there it's uh again april 7th at the sportsman's tavern with uh sue foley you're coming trio he said yep we're coming trio Okay, do you ever tour with Mike? Does he ever hop on the road with you? Um, no, because Mike is out with Jimmy Vaughn, and he does stuff with Billy Gibbons. Um, so right now yes. they're out, they're out with Jimmy. So yeah, so do you from time to time. You're you've got a really cool thing happen with the Jungle Show, which uh, includes uh, Jimmy Vaughn, Billy Gibbons, Chris Layton, and yourself. And Mike Flanagan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, and and Mike. In fact, I um, when, when we did a show together at uh, at the Trail from Buffalo, um, when Mike was playing with Jimmy Vaughn, uh, I, I did the opener, and I had a nice conversation with Mike, and uh, and he ended up sending me a picture later on uh, of him in Texas with, with my T-shirt on. So it was one of the higher compliments I've had in that regard. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. 
<laughs> but um, what else can I say about the album? There, oh yeah, um, Jimmy Donnelly's "Think It Over." It's uh, it's another one of the ballads that you do really so well because you know it's not a blues song. You know when you're singing blues and blues melodies, that's one thing. But when you're you know singing a ballad and popular music, you know you really have to um, stick to some melodies and be able to really sing notes from from another you know scale type um and and you've got a really good range for doing that and there were some other ones on um the ice queen as well you know so you go from the toughest of lowdown blues to ballads and then spanish guitar playing so your diversity is is really showing just on the last two albums alone well thanks yeah i mean when we and when we play live shows when people come out in buffalo i do a an acoustic segment with my nylon string guitar and a little spanish guitar style, some finger picking stuff that I do. And so I try to mix it up because that's the other thing about playing trios. You don't want, I mean, it can get to be the same sound all night, you know, with a, just Telecaster bass and drums. Yeah. So I like to mix it up. It pulls the show into a different direction. Um, and, and it's nice to throw in a ballad or two just to, so it's, everything isn't just a blazing guitar solo, you know, right. it's, it's nice to do those blazing guitar solos, but if you do them all night, you lose impact because people have heard it over and over. And True. It's, it's just that down. same yeah. frequency. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you do mix things up um, also stylistically, you know, like I, like I was saying on the albums, you've got um, some original content and a, a variety of obscure covers. It's not like you're going to be hearing, you know, the same old, um cover songs redone by I mean when you when I hear some of your cover songs I mean even though I'm I'm you know as a DJ and a lover of the music and a musician I know a lot of the stuff I mean from time to time I'll be hearing stuff that would it would sound to me if for, for just a, the average listener oh that's that's one of her songs I mean you've got a knack for for pulling these songs out that uh, and make them your own your own well thanks yeah, thank you for that. That's a big compliment. And that's what we do try to do. If you're going to play a blues song, hopefully you can do a deeper cut, first of all. like And, and these are all really deep cuts on the album. Uh, but yeah, you kind of got to figure out how to make it your own. Yeah. You know, revise it a little bit if you can. Because, you know, at the time that they were being recorded, there could be anomalies for the recording in the session that could have been improved. And, you know, you can... You can maybe do a thing or two with it, um, you know, not necessarily to modernize it, just to just to revise it a little bit. And I like what uh, what we're able to do with the guitar, because like I mentioned, the Frankie Lee Sims song and some of these other songs, you know, the guitar is able to take a more orchestrated uh, or the a piece from a bigger band with the arrangement like uh, like um, Louis Jordan's Blue Light Boogie, and you can interpret those horn lines and some of those vocalizations and melodies on the guitar and, and really make it sound, and it works, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, the guitar is, is really unique in its ability to do something like that. Yeah, and you know, when you're approaching stuff, and this is what I learned playing trio is, you know, a lot of times people play trio and they just feel like you got to solo, 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 and you got to do this grandiose thing. Well, you don't really have to. In fact, less is more. You can just play a rhythm solo or something really, uh, you know, just a little, little melody and, and not try to be like, oh, I've got to be super soloist on every tune. I've got to be, you know, so that's a really important part of, of how I approach this trio thing is like, I, I, I almost give myself a break in the middle of the show. It's almost like I take a break from all that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, melody, let's chill out. Let's play a ballad. Let's relax. I mean, yeah, you got to keep people engaged. And, and if you're just hitting them over the head all the time, they, you, you numb them. So yeah, true. Just, I've learned. <laughs> yeah. One of the yeah. things that I, that I like about say a uh, soloist like Wes Montgomery is when you, you can, you can kind of, even though he doesn't do it on every solo, you can kind of look at what someone like he does brilliantly where, where he will do the solo note, the single note stuff, maybe for a chorus or two, and then he develops it into an octave thing. And then after that, like you mentioned, he, he will just be playing uh, something interesting with block chords and doing the rhythm. So there is like a structure there and, and you can, you can approach things, you know, you're telling your story like, like someone like that does. Yeah. I mean, single note leads only will take you so far. And then, 
people get tired you you wear your audience out so and right. especially with trio i mean you really with trio you really gotta finesse it to keep it interesting even for yourself like i, I don't want to bore myself <laughs> <laughs> hey speaking of finesse um you and single note soloing and really great uh, blues instrumentals you did a really nice job with uh, clarence kate mouth brown's okie dokie stomp and um you, you know ho hopefully you'll be playing playing that i remember seeing clarence i think i opened up for him with the lafayette chap room in my younger days and i got to stand you know just practically inches from him and and watch him play his set and so in between songs um people were you know yelling out this or that and he was just kind of taking a little break there like you say taking a, a little relaxer and i yelled out pressure cooker oh yeah oh my god and he comes up to the microphone he looks over at me he goes oh you want to be punished <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough he played pressure cooker it was it seemed like it was faster than the uh, than the recording and uh god knows what was in that corn cob pipe of his either well we know what was in that pipe <laughs> we it many times, and we used to go see Gate all the time. So Gate was notorious, and um, the way to meet Gate Mouth was to have weed, and and that's what we do. <laughs> if we had weed, we'd just bring it right to the bass player and say, "Can we, you know, can you give this to Gate?" And sometimes he would come and talk to us. You know, I did get to know him a little bit towards the end, but I was a huge Gate Mouth fan. I saw him all the time. As any any time I could get to see him, I would go see him. And he was such a remarkable guitar player, so talented and yeah. such, a great, such a great musician all around. And and as I you know talked about with with Jimmy Vaughn in our interview, I mean he's one of the uh, one of the first you know along <laughs> with like Johnny Guitar Watson and T Bone Walker you know really doing that thing with the big band and um, really you know putting those blues instrumentals out there and, and a more um, uh, kind of like an expanded harmonic approach to, to what he was doing. You know, I, I love that sort of stuff too, as well as I do the gut bucket, you know? Oh yeah. Gate was very sophisticated. I mean, he didn't even want to be called a blues artist. He just wanted to be a musician, you know? Yeah. So yeah, he's a huge influence on me. You know, and, and he's also a good example to, to talk about, um the territorializing uh the blues because like before before the internet before mass communications i mean i think music and especially blues the way we describe it you know like like say mike's mike flanagan's west texas blues or, or west side soul by magic sam or you know south side chicago west side uh, chicago blues like otis rush and all and all that kind of stuff or louisiana like we're talking about you know with gate mouth and texas blues and stuff like that i mean the there, there really was like before it all got homogenized and globalized through through mass communications, I mean, it's important to also recognize the sounds that certain uh, localities, communities, and cities and areas had. Oh yeah, completely. And you know, Austin has a sound. Austin's blues is Austin's blues. It's not Texas blues, like because there was Houston blues and Dallas blues, you know, and there's a Texas tradition and sound. But Austin was its own sound, and I, and that's what drew me down here is. You know when the Vaughn brothers kind of broke out and put Austin on the map. I mean, we heard that sound all over the place, and then we were like, "What is that? That's like a new thing." Um, but I, yeah, I agree. It's it's uh, all those regions are so unique. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I hope to get a chance to to talk to you more about this, and maybe uh, maybe learn a thing or two from you. Uh, just talking about the history and the artists and, and you seem to know so much so much about it and you're passionate about the music like myself and so many others are like our listeners are and uh, i want to encourage them to go to the sportsman's tavern see sue foley she's my special guest tonight april 7th uh, tickets are 25 there's a vip meet and greet that includes the ticket cost a vip laminate signed cd and an official sue foley t-shirt and you get to meet uh, Sue, who was the uh, player of Pinky, you know, the uh, infamous Telecaster. Yes. And uh, yeah, and one more thing. So if you know anything about me and, and how I dress a little bit, um, you know that sleeves are always optional. 
Um, and I hear you know the secret to making the perfect sleeveless shirt. Yeah, I've cut some reels on my Instagram about that. Mike did one <laughs> for me. Uh, yeah, we're we're big into cutting t-shirts here in Texas, especially. All right. Well, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna get myself a, a Sue Foley t-shirt uh, in, in a couple weeks, and uh, or is it next week already? Uh, a couple weeks. A couple weeks. In a couple weeks, and uh, and maybe you can show me how to make that sleeveless the right way. I'd be happy to. We could cut it right there. <laughs> All right. Sue, thanks so much for the time and uh, for being my special guest tonight. Look forward to seeing you and uh, continued success out there on the road. All right. Thanks, Tommy. We'll see you soon. You're welcome. Bye-bye.